Good afternoon and welcome everybody to this event. Now, FNC Investment Trust has reached the ripe old age of 156, but it still embraces innovation. And that's what this is about, bringing our communications with you, the shareholders, further into the 21st century. And that's particularly valuable for shareholders throughout the country and indeed throughout the world who might not have the time or the ability to attend the several events that we hold here in London. And you have the opportunity today to put your questions directly to the senior people who are looking after your investment. With me are our distinguished chairman, B. Holland, and Paul Niven, one of the most highly respected and senior investors within Columbia Threadneedle Investments, who are, of course, the portfolio manager for the trust. Now, we're going to begin with B. Holland, who will set the scene and then hand over to Paul Niven, who will go through the results for 2023 in some detail. And then we'll open for your questions. Now, I've got them here on my iPad and I can see that there's quite a few been submitted already, but you can submit a question now. Simply follow the, the simple instructions in the send box. And my job is to collect the questions and ensure that we get through as many as possible in the time available. So let's get going and over to you, B. Thanks, Steve. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to be involved in this event and be able to engage with our shareholders and prospective investors. While the financial results and the portfolio performance will be presented by Paul, I'd like to make a few remarks which I hope will be relevant to shareholders in terms of our progress as a board and as a trust in delivering our objectives. With long-term results in mind, um, we, oh, I forgot to, we continue to be the go-to solution for capital growth and income for the regular saver, outperforming our benchmark on an annualised basis over the last 10 years. It remains the ambition of the board to deliver real rises in dividends for shareholders over the long term that are sustainable, and I'm therefore very pleased to report another rise in the proposed annual dividend, which will again be fully covered by our revenue. We've retained our position in the FTSE 100 index, which I believe strengthens our visibility and acknowledges our place in the UK investors' portfolio. We strive to have a strong board who challenges, provokes, advises and acts with the utmost integrity and responsibility. The composition of the board is very important to ensure that there are experts across many different fields. We want diversity of thinking as well as knowledge. The board's previous marketing expert was Francesca Escari, who retired during the year, so we're delighted to welcome Anu Chug, who has, who has achieved a successful career in marketing, leading numerous com uh, consumer brands, including being chief executive of Pucker Herbs until recently. This is testament to our understanding as a board of brand and consumer awareness. We continue to support the manager in highlighting what FNC stands for and what it offers to shareholders. I'm sorry to report that Tom Joy will stand, step down from the board on the 31st of March. He's accepted an opportunity to take on a new executive role, which precludes him from continuing as a director of this company. We'll miss his considerable investment knowledge and experience in the global equity markets. The process to recruit his successor is very nearly concluded, and we expect to make an announcement at or shortly after the AGM. Um, and lastly, before I hand over to Paul, in due course, shareholders will be able to apply for tickets to our bi-annual lecture called FNC Live, which this year will be around the theme Social Change and Future Generations. It's a great event to hear from thought-provoking speakers and includes, including our fund manager and mingle with other shareholders and learn more about the company. It will be on the 6th of June and I really hope to see many of you there. Thank you very much. Over to you. Thank you, B. Uh, and good afternoon, Everyone this afternoon, um, it's great to um, be aware that there are so many shareholders watching uh, this uh, event. So I'm going to spend the next 15 minutes or so running through the annual results from 2023. We obviously have uh, posted online our annual report and that's got a lot of detail in there. So I'm going to touch on the, the highlights from last year. But again, there's a lot more detail that can be found online. Before we get going, uh, there is uh, some points with respect to investment risk as well as a glossary and historic uh, performance that I should uh, point out. But moving on to um, 
just a bit of context and background uh, and to remind you of uh, the history of uh, FNC Investment Trust. Um, as Stephen said, 156 years worth of history thus far, the world's oldest investment trust. Uh, and as part of our 150th celebrations a few years ago, we undertook a great deal of research about the, the, the background and history of the trust. And um, um, uh, we're pleased to say that the trust has paid a dividend every single year since launched back in 1868. It's also the longest continually listed company in the UK. And as B said, another dividend rise is planned for uh, 2023. And that brings to 53 years the number of consecutive dividend rises which we will have delivered. There's been high level of consistency, uh, I think, in terms of performance, which we'll talk about, but also in terms of management of the trust. So I, I am the 11th manager in the last 150 years, and we've only had three actually since 19. 19- 69. In recent decades, we have been investing in growth assets. Um, we were 95% in equities by uh, 1965 uh, and have a very long history of both equity investments, going back to the 1920s, uh, and private market investments uh, when we made for our first private investments in 1942. We've got substantial scale, so just under £5 billion in terms of market cap with our net assets around $5.2 billion at the end of January. And as B said, we are uh, a FTSE 100 constituent, one of the largest listed companies in the UK. In terms of our uh, overall objectives and how we, we approach to uh, deliver on those objectives, the overriding aim of uh, the trust is to deliver long-term growth in capital and income. And that, that's an important point, that long-term perspective. Our approach is very much focused on exposure to listed and unlisted global growth assets. What does that mean? Uh, Essentially, listed equity and private equity. And as we go through, I'll give you a sense about how we're invested and which areas we have exposure to. The way that we approach investments is uh, by blending a range of focused active strategies. So, Again, reflecting on B's comments, we look to to provide essentially a one-stop shop for investors who are looking for a single portfolio that will provide them exposure to uh, growth assets. So by diversifying across strategies, each of which is focused on a standalone basis, but by combining them, we hope to smooth the performance outcome for end shareholders uh, and provide an appropriate level of diversification. So adding risk while reducing return. We also have a commitment to a net zero carbon portfolio by 2050 or earlier. And there's a a plan and trajectory for uh, against which we uh, we 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 look to uh, deliver against that outcome. Uh, And in terms of outcomes, the the what we look to deliver for shareholders is consistency, consistency in terms of performance delivery, but also value for money for shareholders. And that, again, is a point that the board are very much focused on. So in terms of the highlights for the results uh, for 2023. Um, This slide here uh, outlines some of the key points. Firstly, from a shareholder return perspective, we delivered a return of 8.1%. So it was a a, a strong year in absolute terms. Uh, The underlying NAV, uh, net asset value, uh, total return was 11.3%. And the benchmark was was higher still at 15.1%. Our discount widened on the year, uh, starting at 3% and ending at 59 And that difference in terms of moving from 3 to 5.9% explains uh, the gap between the NAV total return of 113 and the shareholder return of 81 In response to that widening in our discount, we bought in shares. Uh, buying back shares at a discount to... A net asset value is accretive, uh, adds, adds value for shareholders. So we bought back 8.6 million shares through buybacks during the year. It was a good year for net revenue return. It was up by 13.7% on the year. So our, our income was 15.83 pence. That was a new high for us. In gross terms, we earned over £100 million in income last year for the first time. Um, and that, that led the board to agree a proposal of an 8.9% rise in dividend for the year to 14.7 pence. So comparing that 14.7 pence dividend against the revenue of 15.83 shows you that our dividend is covered uh, again, i.e. we earned more than we plan to pay out. 
and that is the 53rd consecutive annual rise in dividends which is proposed. I'll talk about the underlying portfolio and what worked, what didn't work, but a key point was private equity, which has over the longer run been an area of strength for us and, and provided excess returns against listed markets. But last year, it did significantly lag very strong listed market returns, and that did detract from uh, our NAV on the year. Um, the other key point, just in terms of relative return contribution, was an underweight exposure uh, overall. Not not that significant, but given the magnitude of returns last year, actually, it had a, a meaningful impact in terms of our, our performance outcome. But an underweight exposure to those mega cap uh, growth stocks in the US it was a very, very concentrated market last year and has th- thus far in 2024 continued to be relatively concentrated. And that was detrimental. So in other words, being underweight, those really highly performing large stocks in the US on the equity portfolio did um, did uh, drag from our, our relative returns against the, the, the benchmark. On the point of value for money, I, I'm pleased to say that our ongoing charges fell uh, down to 0.49%. That is down from 0.54% in 2022. And that, that continues a recent trend of reduction in ongoing charges. And that reflects again in the value for money point. And that was helped by a reduced management fee uh, with us as managers of the trust. So again, you know, scale the scale of the product, uh, the trust, bringing benefit through through reduced charges. Just uh, in a bit more detail, um, um, this slide decomposes um, the share price total return all the way over on the right hand side there against the the benchmark uh, into component parts. So we run through this quickly, left to right. So the underlying portfolio of investments uh, where we have exposure to listed equity and to private equity delivered a return of 11.7% on the year. Um, uh, The two main reasons why we lagged that benchmark return, as I said, of 15.1% were our private equity return, private equity in aggregate produced a return of minus 1.7% last year. So that was very meaningfully behind uh, returns from listed equities, and and again, that was a drag. And the other point was that we were underweight to those large growth stocks. That was also a detractor. In terms of quantifying the the respective impact of those two variables, again, that 11.7 against 15.1, there's around about a 3% uh, geometric difference in between those two numbers. Two-thirds of that was the private equity uh, uh, performance, and around one-third was the underexposure to the mega cap. Uh, take names so um, gearing was additive so that added some value last year because we we had borings which were then invested into the market uh, in a rising market that was additive to returns we bought back stock as as i said 8.6 million uh, shares at a discount again that added some value there was a modest change in the fair value of our debt as a function of changes in market interest rates detracted very slightly and then we've got management fees and interest and other expenses which detracted. So you add up the 11.7 with all those uh, numbers which uh, follow from that, and that gives the NAV total return of 11.3%. As I said, we moved from a 3% discount to a 5.9% discount, and that detracted a 3.2% from shareholder total return, and that leads to the 8.1% share price total return. So that is the decomposition of return uh, a high level on the uh, on the trust last year, um, strong year in absolute terms, but obviously lagging uh, a very an unexpectedly strong environment for listed equities. I spend a, a minute on um, this slide, which shows the point about having a range of different strategies in the portfolio, uh, each of which is focused, but which are blended together uh, to ensure diversification hopefully adding return while reducing risk for end shareholders. So what we've got here is exposure to different strategies like US growth, US value, and so on, all the way on the right-hand side there to cover private equity, which ended the year just over 11% of our our total assets in private equity. I've also shown you what the start of year position was, or end of 2022, and the end of year position to give a sense about how the portfolio actually changed over that year, not into the stock level, but into the strategy level of consideration. There's a couple of points I draw out here. Um, One, we had successfully, I think, navigated what had been really quite um, significant 
uh, 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 volatility in terms of growth and value stocks, growth stocks being highly rated or, or for want of a better word, expensive stocks um, with high growth prospects and expectations against those that have lower valuations, perhaps with lower growth expectations, particularly in the US. So we came into 2022 with actually an overweight position in US value. US value had meaningfully outperformed US growth stocks in the prior year, 2022. And as I said, we'd navigated what had been quite a volatile period in both 2021 and 2022 in terms of that growth value trade. In the very early part of the year, we actually made a few changes. We leveled up largely the exposure between growth and value, uh, given the outperformance which we'd uh, seen from the value segment of the market, um, reducing the respective value gap between those two areas. Uh, and we thought it was a, perhaps going to be a less conducive environment in terms of the economic and fundamental backdrop for value stocks in 2023. So we levelled up exposure between those two areas. We also made a couple of other changes, um, most notably um, reducing and selling out actually in entirety um, of our uh, long-standing US growth manager, T. Rowe Price, uh, and making a, a, a new commitment um, to JP Morgan, who now run that US growth part of the, the portfolio. Uh, a couple of other points um, I, I would uh, draw out uh, as well. Global small cap, an area that we used to have exposure to on the portfolio. We sold out of that a couple of years ago. It's obviously struggled in performance terms. We've continued with a zero weighting uh, there. And we incepted a, a couple of new strategies, actually, global focus and global enhanced, um, uh, both of which provide um, concentrated uh, exposure to uh, global equity, um, uh, well, in the case of Global Focus, Global Growth Stocks, run by um, Dave Dudding within Columbia Threadneedle, uh, and Global Enhanced, which basically uh, looks to provide uh, returns which are additive to the rest of the portfolio and which is run uh, by our quantitative team within Columbia Threadneedle. Private equity reducing in allocation modestly on the year. So there's a few changes, most notably, I think, in the U.S., uh, in terms of the overall um, the overall allocation between growth and value. In addition, um, we reduced cash levels on the year, and that led to uh, a rise in gearing. We came into 2023 with actually not a particularly positive view in terms of the economic backdrop, and, and subsequently, as I'm sure we'll discuss, we were positively surprised in response to that cash levels were reduced uh, through the year and we ended up with a slightly higher gearing level come the end of uh, December 23. A few words on revenue and dividends. I made some of these point alre points already, but um, it was a really good year for uh, revenue overall. This just gives a snapshot of the last few years in terms of the progression in dividends. As I said, that proposal of a 14.7 pence uh, dividend for 23 will be the 53rd consecutive rise. We've seen good progress in terms of revenue per share, which also hit a, a new high. And our revenue reserves, um, you know, one of the great benefits of the investment trust structure is that in good times, we can put aside some of um, revenue that we don't pay out in dividends into revenue reserves that we can hold back in the event that we need to supplement um, a revenue shortfall uh, to make a dividend payment. Um, and we've got very substantial levels of revenue reserves around 21 pence per share at the end of last year, which is £107 million. Um, so we're in a really strong position, I think, not only to um, uh, uh, meet the, 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 uh, the near-term expectations in terms of um, uh, dividend growth, but again, to B's point, that long-term aspiration to deliver rising uh, dividends for shareholders over the long term. Um couple of words on uh, debt. Um, again, one of the advantages of the investment trust structure is that we can borrow to invest. And we didn't undertake any new borrowings last year. But uh, in prior years, we really took advantage of what was uh, an incredible environment uh, for borrowers, uh, locking in uh, interest rates at extraordinarily low levels. And this gives a sense of, of what we've achieved there. So we've got around £580 million pounds worth of fixed rate debt on the trust. This shows the split by maturity, so how much um, of that debt um, um, matures over the next 10 years, the next 10 to 20, and so on. 
and the corresponding fixed interest rate that we pay per maturity uh, uh, bucket. So as an example, uh, 30 to 40 years, we're paying uh, a blended rate of around 2.14% for our borrowings all the way out there. And in fact, uh, a couple of years ago, we undertook borrowing out to 2061 at 1.87% fixed. So really low rates of uh, interest that we pay on those borrowings, um, down very substantially in recent years. Uh, and repeating the point I made a few moments ago, gearing levels rose uh, over the year from 7.3% at the start to 9.9% at the end, with debt at uh, par. So there was a modest rise in gearing levels over, over the 12-month period. Uh, sustainability and ESG, responsible investing. This is a really uh, important aspect that the, the boards and, and we as uh, investment managers consider. Um, all the underlying managers, uh, indeed Columbia Thread Needle, are signatories of the UN PRI. Columbia Thread Needle were one of the uh, founding signatories. We've got long heritage in terms of consideration of responsible investment uh, issues. We've got a very, very well-resourced team within Columbia Thread Needle who, um, who undertake voting and engagement with companies into which we invest uh, on our behalf. Uh, the board made a commitment to a net zero target, uh, as I said, uh, uh, of the underlying portfolio by 2050 or earlier. So there is a, this trajectory which we're on to um, meet again, meet that overall uh, objective. Um, this slide here gives you a sense of some of the issues that we raised with companies across, uh, in this instance, 28 countries. And again, in the annual reporting account, there's a few case studies that we've drawn out uh, which really bring to life, I think, some of the activity which we are undertaking at the portfolio level in terms of engagement with the companies in which we uh, invest on your behalf. Portfolio exposure. So um, reflecting on those strategies and when we put them all together and think about the overall portfolio exposure, uh, in this case on the left-hand side, including private equity, this gives um, uh, a, a breakdown about how, how we were invested at the end of the year. So the the majority, 57% or thereabouts, of assets in North America, that is the majority of, uh, the majority of our investments are. Uh, Europe, 10.6, emerging markets, 8.6, and so on. So this is the decomposition of exposure, including private equity. As I said, private equity around about uh, 11% of the portfolio at year end. On the right-hand side here, this shows uh, the breakdown of uh, the sectoral exposure in terms of listed equity, so how much is in technology, consumer discretionary, financials, and uh, so on. And again, um, we've talked about this, this long-term perspective. There are a number of key performance indicators outlined in the annual report which show how we've de delivered uh, for shareholders in shareholder total return terms, in NAV terms, in dividend growth terms, over multiple time periods. So there's a lot of data you can look at in terms of what we've achieved for shareholders. And this is this is just one snapshot I've chosen to represent that long-term perspective. And uh, it is, it is since I took over management with the portfolio, which was mid-2014, so that's almost 10 years ago. A left-hand chart here shows you performance of open-ended funds, open-ended funds, OICs and CCAVs, um, which are an alternative investment medium for investors beyond the investment trusts. They've lagged um, um, uh, in median terms uh, returns from a passive equivalent, which is the Vanguard ETF, which has in turn delivered returns broadly in line with the FTSE All World Index, as you'd expect from passive product. However, our NAV uh, net asset value total return has exceeded that benchmark index, and our share price total return has further exceeded uh, uh, that index. And again, the EIC uh, median is how our returns in NAV and share price total return terms compare to our closed-ended competitors, i.e. other investment trusts who invest into global equities. And on the discount, um, we were uh, not so long ago trading, trading at a premium, actually, and we have been issuing shares in recent years. We did, as I said, end the year around a uh, 6% of thereabouts discount uh, wide in the start of the year. Um, but again, the board uh, remained focused on uh, ensuring that they're doing the right thing for shareholders and there's an active buyback program when the discount uh, widens. In addition to that, I should say, there, is a no there are numerous other activities which we undertake to promote the trust to shareholders because we do think that that is uh, part of um, uh, the remedial action which is required 
in order to get the uh, share price closer to underlying net asset value. Um, finally, a few comments just in terms of the outlook summary. The backdrop fundamentally for financial markets and the global economy is better, I think it's fair to say, than we expected 12 months ago. Recession has been avoided in the US thus far. Um, we reduced cash, raised gearing levels, reflects again better fundamental backdrop. Interest rate cuts are likely to be forthcoming for major central banks, US Federal Reserve, Bank of England, European Central Bank as we move through this year. Probably around the middle of the year is most likely point around June when the first interest rate cuts may, um, may, may um, be implemented by US Federal Reserve in particular. Uh, so easier policy, lower rates, that's good for financial markets typically. Um, equity markets, and there are some, uh, uh, some, some points we can talk about this in due course, but equity markets are not cheap. They're trading quite rich relative to history in valuation terms, driven predominantly by valuations in the US, that mega cap, to- uh, mega cap tech space of the market. But that is balanced against a better growth backdrop um, and, again, as I said, easier policy. We know there's going to be some big events coming later this year uh, in terms of politics and elections, not just in the UK, but clearly in the US. That may lead to some volatility, uncertainty. Uh, but again, that I think is counterbalanced by a positive fundamental backdrop. At this point of valuation, I think um, we certainly have not reached levels of excess that we have seen in uh in prior periods that, that some are, are, are pointing to as, as, as similar to now, i.e. the late 1990s and the, the dot-com boom and subsequent bust. Uh, but I do think it's right and appropriate for us to offer balanced exposure to the, those growth stocks which offer high prospects in terms of future returns but also come with relatively high uh, valuations against some uh, cheap areas of the market in the value space. And for private equity... Disappointing year. We've got good long term results from that area, and there are some signs of progress in terms of um, possible exits coming through, um, some movement in the private equity market, improving market sentiment. So uh, we're hopeful that we will see better return from that area on the portfolio as well looking forward. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. Right, I've been scrolling through the host of questions that you've submitted here. What I'm going to do is put as many of them together so we can get through, you know, they may not be literally your questions if you're listening, but I'm going to put as many of them together. And there's several here about dividends, which have been referred to. And what is your, I put this to be, I think, what is your outlook for dividend growth and is it sustainable? This is in the future. Uh, that's, that's fair enough. So we are hoping, first of all, to, I think as Paul said, pay an increased dividend this year, um, which has to go to our AGM, which is going to be an 8.9% increase. That means that over the last one, three, five, and 10 years, we will have paid a real increase in dividend. The board wants to be able to sustain that over the long run. It's not going to happen every year. I mean, clearly it didn't happen in 2022 when inflation was very high, but we did pay a small increase then, and then we were able to pay a much larger increase this year because of the reserves that we were, uh, the income that had come in. Um, and I think that, as Paul's alluded to, with our um, reserves, it means that in the years where it might not be, it might be some leaner years, we'll be able to hopefully continue to increase the dividend on an annual basis. We've done it for 53 years. As Paul said, we paid a dividend every year in the 160, 56 years of our history. And so we're hoping that, um, you know, we can continue that record. Good, good. Right, there's several questions which I put on the sort of market outlook category. I'm going to put these to Paul. And one angle is we've had this magnificent seven dominating global markets. They look a bit of a bubble. We've got all these geopolitical risks in Gaza, Ukraine and elsewhere. Are you a bit nervous? Is this not time to get a bit defensive with your portfolio? Okay, so I think think there's always uncertainty when one looks forward um, uh, there are always events and risks which one has to consider in terms of the outlook and I think you've highlighted some of the, the key ones this this year and where, where we are today the Magnificent Seven phenomenal performance driven um, by a relatively narrow cohort of stocks and NVIDIA uh, continuing to deliver extraordinary returns year to date um, and then politics later this year as well as obviously geopolitics and conflict they, these are all uh, so valuations, uh, politics, conflict, create uncertainty, potentially. 
I think one has to, and, and, and certainly one has to be open-minded with respect to how events might change and what might unfold in the months and quarters ahead. And, and again, reflecting what I said, uh, not just a few moments ago, but 12 months ago, you know, I think one has to be humble in terms of one's ability to foresee the future and how things might, might change for better or indeed for worse. What I would say is that, um, firstly, valuation uh, concerns. I think, I think I, again, I would subscribe to a view that the market, equity markets are, are trading on the rich side of history. And, um, but I, I would not subscribe to a view that we are in bubble territory. And certainly, if one wants to draw comparisons, again, with the late 1990s, things got a lot more uh, overblown in terms of uh, valuation in the technology sector compared to what we see now. And NVIDIA, again, is a, is a good example of that. Trading on a high multiple, but if one looks on forward earnings, it's trading on the mid-30s. If one looks at those more optimistic but realistic expectations for 12 months out. So maybe, maybe the valuation is not quite as high, or excess valuation is not quite as high as some people fear, because these are real businesses delivering real growth, uh, high rates of growth, and hopefully will grow into or relatively high levels of valuations. Um, I think on the, the politics and geopolitics, um, uh, we'll see how things unfold. Clearly, there's a big election in the US uh, come November. It may well uh, be that um, Donald Trump gets back in. That will obviously be less of a surprise this time than last. Uh, more deregulation, maybe more concerns about central bank independence uh, You know, if he, if he gets into the White House. Uh, and he may well have his own agenda that he wishes to pursue in terms of um, uh, 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 issues to address in response to challenges that he's faced from a legal perspective in recent and coming months. So there's a lot of uncertainty, but I think that from where I'm sitting, the fundamental backdrop of reasonable growth, declining interest rates and good liquidity and valuations, which are, are rich but not really that extended, uh, presents a reasonably favourable backdrop. So I've got another question which links up to how you've just ended there, which is there's a lot of talk about lower investment returns more generally in the years ahead. What do you think about that? And do you think it's getting harder for active managers to beat these indices? Uh, okay, so firstly, lower returns. I mean, all else being equal, higher valuations as a starting point does historically tend to lead to lower returns going forward. But one has to take really quite a long perspective for those historic results to be robust i.e you know you could have high valuations today but it's really only, only in a 10 plus year view that you can have confidence as to what those valuations might mean for returns i.e high valuations don't have much impact on 12 months two year three year year returns they can get more expensive for sure over those shorter term horizons but i think it is fair to say that um High valuations should give rise, uh, at least a pause for thought for investors as to what prospective returns might be. And valuations are, are certainly um, relatively high compared to history in equities. Unless there is a um, fundamental change in terms of underlying productivity and a step change in corporate earnings growth, then I think it's fair to conclude that returns on a multi, multi-year multi view are likely to be lower than those that we've enjoyed over the last 10, 15 years, which have really been quite exceptional compared to historic norms. On the point on active management, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, uh, it's, it's been a really difficult environment in general for active managers in a very narrowly focused market. Uh, the narrower the market is and the less number of stocks that are really driving returns, it is um, hard for, for portfolio managers, active portfolio managers to keep pace uh, unless they have significant positions in those those holdings. Uh, and overweight positions that they want to deliver outperformance. Uh, the thing, the consensus view is that there should be a broadening in terms of investment returns. It remains to be seen whether that's that actually unfolds or not. Often, you know, the 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 the, the pain trade is is more of the same, and that certainly would be a pain trade for I think most investors. So we wouldn't be surprised if it's a rel continues to be a relatively narrow market. But it remains it remains difficult for active managers. I think that is a fundamental reality. It is difficult to add value in what are efficient markets and um, the way that we approach that is diverse uh, is concentrated portfolios run by specialists where we diversify across those different strategies again so specialists but diversifying so we're not spending too much risk on one particular 
sector, segment, or particular outcome. Thank you. Good. Sounds cautiously optimistic. <laughs> right, so I've got several questions here. Um, it's been observed that discounts to net assets have been widening across the sector, and I think this should go to UB. What can the board do to narrow that discount and improve the returns to shareholders? Um, thank you, Stephen. I'll answer it quite quickly because I think that Paul already um, put some words to this. But first of all, share buybacks. We are actively buyback shares. We've asked um, Paul and his team to to make sure that that is done. Uh, so we are all in the market whenever is necessary. And I think as the market knows that, they know that, that that's a good thing for um, the shareholders. Um, I think the other thing is that we also have tried very hard to raise the profile of the trust in recent years. We've um, rebranded. We are looking to younger investors by um, advertising both on uh, television, Sky, ITV+, Plus, but more recently now on um, both TikTok and YouTube as well. Um, and so I think those things are supposed to enhance and, and give us brand recognition, which means we should be the go-to investment trust for people when they're thinking about a global steady investment trust for them to purchase. Um, and finally, I think um, performance is obviously key. Um, you know, the, the investment trusts with good performance tend not to um, trade at, at very wide discounts. And so one of the things we do as a board is to to challenge Paul and his team to um, make sure that they are uh, performing well, which um, isn't hasn't been too bad. Thank you. Um, now, this one, I think, is for Paul. You've mentioned a couple of times the commitment to net zero. I've got one of your shareholders here accusing you, well, not accusing you, but asking you about whether there's any greenwashing involved and whether that commitment to net zero is constraining your investment particularly to companies like Shell, which I think was your first equity investment. Well, not you personally, but the trust. Yeah, that, 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 that was before my time. Um, so yeah, I think, this, firstly, this is a long-term commitment. It's a serious commitment. We've got very substantial resources, uh, again, within the organisation that we work with the board uh, to provide this, this roadmap that we look to uh, work with underlying investee companies to ensure that they are meeting obligations uh, that they should have to meet their own net zero targets. Um, uh, we're not precluded from investing in the likes of Shell uh, or BP today. In fact, in many respects, some of these large energy companies are going to be part of the solution, provided that they uh, manage the transition well themselves. So um, we have some specific areas of exclusion, um, which are the really carbon intensive uh, areas, uh, such as thermal coal, for example, where some specific restrictions implemented. Um, in terms of uh, managing and, and against that the, the constraints, again, the long-term objective is delivery of growth in capital and income. And over the last few years, we have navigated between you know, expensive carbon light uh, stocks and, and cheaper carbon heavy stocks relatively successfully, I, I think. But over time, we expect the, the carbon intensity of the portfolio to, to, to move down. Do you engage with your investments directly about their own carbon strategy? No, absolutely. I mean, that is a, that is a key part of the, uh, the plan for us to hit our net zero targets is that underlying companies into which we can invest do the right thing in terms of meeting their net zero commitments. And it ultimately, you know, decisions have to be made, will have to be made, with respect to um, companies that are not meeting obligations as we see fit so again this this large team that we have within the organization columbia thread needle we use extensively to engage with uh, companies that may be seen as, as bad actors in terms of carbon intensity and ensure that they're on the right pathway okay thanks right um as the share price as someone has asked is getting nearer to 10 pounds um are you thinking of doing a share split and B, I think this is for you, isn't it? Um, yes, I, I can answer that. Um, we absolutely think about this and consider it all the time. I mean, on the one hand, it, it might make sense for us to do it because if we have a lower share price, we can uh, attract people that have only got a small amount of money to invest on a monthly basis through our savings plan, for example. But sometimes, you know, a lower share price might have negative com 
connotations um, in sense of value. In fact, it would be quite interesting if anybody wanted to uh, give us their or was it the views on online. We'd be very interested to hear what our what our current shareholders and, and potential investors think. And there is going to be feedback at the Excellent. end, which we're well, going to talk I'd about. like that then. Yes, okay. good. That would be very helpful. Right. I've got several questions on the structure of the portfolio. Um, I suppose I'll ask them separately. You have a large number of holdings with your different strategies in the fund. Are you concerned that this dilutes the performance? And would you be better off with a, a more concentrated portfolio of high conviction holdings? It's a good question and one that, that we get asked frequently and one that we, we discuss with the board again uh, in terms of you know what we're looking to deliver on uh, broad objectives. And, and if you think about um, what most of our shareholders want from us in terms of that delivery of long-term growth in capital and income and how we have positioned uh, the, the trust from a propositional perspective, um, it is to provide a portfolio which um, which provides broadly diversified exposure across a range of different underlying uh, uh, segments of the market, geographically, sectorally, as well as from a stock perspective, in order that the end shareholder has um, uh, exposure to um, a range of underlying a range of underlying components. So the one-stop shop uh, principle, which I, I mentioned, you know, if, if investors are looking for one portfolio, which will give them exposure to global equities and private equity, we would like them to think about F and C. If we went down the route of a highly concentrated mandate, uh, and others in the market do do this clearly, then I, I don't think that personally fits the, the requirement that the end shareholder will typically expect from us, which is that single portfolio, which will deliver close to an all-weather solution for them, respecting that we're investing in equities. Um, and again, the, the point of diversification and principle of diversification is one, that one can add returns while reducing risk if you blend together components which um, behave differently at different points in the cycle. So one can get extreme outcomes, clearly, on the upside and on the downside with concentrated portfolios. We look to provide a smoother performance outcome, and that's achieved through diversification. So I think the, the, the approach remains appropriate. Concentrated portfolios blended together. Okay, I've got a number of questions about private equity, which you point out has been a real winner for the trust in the longer term, Has not was not a winner last year, and are you concerned about the future prospects of private equity? And are you reconsidering the overall allocation? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's a really interesting question. Again, something that we've discussed at length uh, with the boards and, and strategically it's been, a, it's been a good area for investment for the trust for many, many years. Um, one, and we assess that um, formally by looking at the excess return or not of private equity against listed equity. So because that's essentially an opportunity cost you take from public equity and put it into private equity, capital into private equity. Uh, and we've had a good experience there. Um, I think in general terms that um, the environment is 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 a harder one for private equity, given that we are coming off an era of uh, extraordinarily cheap money or, or low interest rates uh, into an environment where obviously inflation has been higher, interest rates have been raised. It's harder to, um, it's harder to not only get borrowing, but the cost of of borrowing has risen and a lot of private equity returns have been about cheap leverage I think frankly so we have seen I think um, uh, from a longer term perspective a, a compression in terms of um, excess returns over of private over public markets diminishing which means that private equity perhaps on average is not going to provide the same level of excess return going forward that it has historically but I think that private equity does continue to represent a very interesting opportunity for the trust because the dispersion or the, the, the difference between the winners and losers in the private equity space is substantially bigger than the winners and losers from a portfolio manager perspective in the, in the, in the listed space. So there's a lot of opportunities, but the selection is really key in the private equity space. So... We continue to commit to private equity opportunities, but it is selective uh, and we think it, it's thoughtful um, and we'll continue to um, not only assess the, the program through time, but assess the individual opportunities that we see in that space. Good, good. 
Well, I've got somebody here who's congratulating you and your 2061 borrowing at 1.8% and is asking whether, given that gearing has been uh, successful, whether you have any plans to increase the gearing. So I, I don't, don't have an immediate, any immediate plans to tactically uh, increase the gearing. As I said, I think the, the environment is, is reasonably constructive, not without risks, as we've, as we've talked about for sure. Um, but that level, you know, looking to in debt par of around about 10%, is about right, I think. Uh, we have some more capacity to, to raise uh, uh, gearing modestly from current levels, but I'm comfortable comfortable where we are. And just to, to repeat the point, and perhaps for the benefit of the, the, the viewers and listeners um, uh, to this event, you know, that, that 1.87%, putting it in context, if we can earn a return, if we take that, that those borrowings, put it into um, investments, as long as we earn an excess, uh, sorry, a return, which exceeds the cost of borrowings, that is that that's going to be accretive or add to returns. So that's a very low hurdle for us to deliver value through borrowings over a long period of time. But I don't have any uh, immediate plans to um, be significantly raising gearing at the present time. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, there's a number of questions about whether various charts can be reviewed and, and whether it's online. The whole uh, thing will be online, as I think you'll find out in a minute. Um, it just uh, remains for me to thank B. Holland and Paul Niven for participating here today. Uh, our greatest thanks go, however, to you, the shareholders, for taking part of this event. Thank you for all your questions. And I would just like to wish you a very successful and happy rest of 2024 and beyond. Thank you.